Hello, everyone. Welcome. Bonjour tout le monde. Thank you for joining us today for Heart and Strokes Women's Heart and Brain Health Research Webinar Series, the third session in this series, Research Impacts and Opportunities 3. For those of you who've joined us before, bear with me. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, some housekeeping. So we have two ways that you can join us by audio today. You can join us with our computer audio, in which case, please make sure your speakers are on and that the uh, volume is high or you can join us by telephone. When you click phone call, a telephone number will be generated and you can log in. Please make sure that you're muted. Everyone should be muted automatically, but in the event that you're not, please make sure that you mute yourself to make sure that audio quality is good for everyone. We'll be taking questions through the question box in the GoToWebinar toolbar. There's a gray bar that says question with a drop back down. Please type in your questions here and we'll forward them to our moderator who will direct them to our speakers. We'll take your questions throughout the session. The session will be recorded and a link to the recording will be made available after the webinar. We'll share the link to the Heart and Stroke YouTube channel with everyone, as well as a link to an evaluation form and ask that you please take just a few minutes to fill out that evaluation form as it helps inform future programming like this. And we're so pleased that you were able to join us for today for maybe our previous installments in the webinar series as well, but ask that you keep the conversation going. So follow us on Twitter at Heart and Stroke and follow our hashtags, hashtag Heart and Stroke Science and hashtag Beat in Equity. Finally, if you've not yet marked your calendar for next week, I can ask that you consider doing so. It'll be the final installment in our series where we look at the progress we've made to date related to sex and gender and taking a more nuanced approach to building on that with an intersectional lens. I also wanted to flag for you that Heart and Stroke will be co-hosting a webinar on May 4th with Heart Life on enhancing virtual heart failure care. Now, before moving into the body of our program, I want to pause, uh, as always, and acknowledge the land on which I am joining you today from here in Ottawa. I'm a settler uh, on the traditional and unceded lands of the Algonquin Anishinaabeg peoples, particularly at a time when many of us are being told to shelter in place or stay in place. I ask that you consider what the history of that place is, the history of the peoples who came before you and the living histories of the people who continue to be in your immediate geographic and social circles. I also want to acknowledge that this is a very challenging time. We are in a crisis in Canada with COVID, but that COVID is having a disproportionate effect on many in our country. And it's exacerbating historic and persistent inequities of health. So I ask that you think about that as well as you listen to our panelists today. And it's precisely because of these inequities that this initiative uh, was started. So a little bit of background for those of you new to us. Starting in 2016, Heart and Stroke received $5 million from Health Canada to contribute to new knowledge related to women's heart and brain health to ultimately change policy and practice, but also to accelerate the adoption of sex and gender-based analysis and build capacity for those working in the field, as well as by research funders in the country. And we've accomplished this by partnering, by holding knowledge translation events, much like this one, um, but also by funding research directly. We were able to leverage that $5 million investment and turn it into $8.5 million by partnering with CIHR, as well as with donor dollars to ensure that we could have a broader reach and fund even more projects than initially able. We've been able to fund 26 projects across the country. And this investment has really catalyzed a fundamental shift in the way Heart and Stroke funds research. Even last year with the economic downturn and being affected by COVID, $17 million of research was funded and all new research competitions require that sex and gender be accounted for in our competitions. So today, we're going to hear from a small subset of some of the researchers uh, funded through this initial investment. Next slide, please. And we will also be hearing about some of the um, reflections that they have as far as next steps and opportunities and where this field will go. We are very lucky to be in the very capable hands of Dr. Ugo Chinieri, Vivian Uka. She will be moderating for today. 
She is a postdoctoral fellow at the Department of Epidemiology, Biostatistics, and Occupational Health at McGill University. She's funded by Fonds de la Recherche en Santé du Québec and supervised by Drs. Robert Platt and Natalie Dian. Her research focuses on the short and long-term outcomes of pregnancy complications and development and validation of prediction models in maternal and perinatal health. Dr. Uka holds a master's degree in public health from the University of Sheffield in England and a PhD in reproductive and developmental sciences from the University of British Columbia. She is also currently the Vice President Academic of the McGill Association of Postdoctoral Fellows and is a committee member of the Society for Pediatric and Perinatal Epidemiologic Research Trainee and Outreach Committees. And I'm very pleased to hand things over to Dr. Uka. Thank you very much, Kristin, for that introduction. I'm very excited to be moderating the session today and because we have a great panel of four interesting speakers who will be talking about their research. So the first speaker is Dr. Natalie Auger, who I know pretty well. Dr. Auger is a physician in the Department of Preventive and Public Health Medicine, Shum, and is also an associate clinical professor at the School of Public Health, University of Montreal. Her research interests in epidemiology include focusing on the application of novel methods in data analysis using administrative databases, surveillance of congenital anomalies in Quebec, maternal substance use and health of women and children over the life course, pregnancy and maternal cardiovascular health later in life, neonatal morbidity and outcomes in children as they grow, and environmental exposures and maternal child health. Our second speaker is Dr. Thalia Field. Dr. Field is an associate professor in the Division of Neuro Neurology at the University of British Columbia. She's a stroke ne neurologist and clinician researcher with a focus on clinical trials. She's currently leading a national study examining treatment strategies and prognosis of cerebral venous thrombosis, a rare cause of stroke primarily affecting younger women. She has a particular interest in process improvement in clinical trials, including working with patients to identify important outcomes and integrating existing and emerging technology to enhance efficiency and engage underrepresented populations. Next slide, please. Our third speaker is Dr. Kaberi Das Gupta. Dr. Das Gupta is a physician scientist and a professor of medicine tenured at McGill University and the McGill University Health Center. Her research focuses, is, her research focuses on the prevention, reversal, and self-management support in diabetes. She's the director of the Center for Outcomes Research and Evaluation, CORE, at the Research Institute of the McGill University Health Center. And our last but not least speaker today is Dr. Ellen Jiwa. Dr. Jiwa is a professor at the Department of Pharmacology and Physiology at the University of Montreal, and is also the director of the Laboratory of Neurovascular Pharmacology. Her research interests include the study of mechanisms underlying cerebrovascular regulation in health and diseases, especially in the context of hypertension and arterial stiffness. The main objective of her research is to find therapeutic targets to protect the brain from vascular diseases. To reach this objective, she's using various techniques from molecular biology to brain imaging in mice and humans. So without further ado, I will pass the stage now to Dr. Oje. Thank you, Vivian. That very nice presentation. Can, can everyone hear me? All good. Oh, thank you. Okay, so um, my name is Natalie Oje. As Vivian explained, I'm at the University of Montreal. I'm an epidemiologist. Um, <clears throat> uh, oh, thank you. Um, we were funded, our team was funded by a Heart and Stroke Foundation in a grant and aid to look at how pregnancy correlates with cardiovascular disease. Uh, we're presently in our third year of funding and um, uh, one of our goal or our, our main goal is to look at how pregnancy relates to the long-term risk of cardiovascular disease uh, up to like 30 years after pregnancy. 
Um, we do this because um, the growing body of literature showing that pregnancy is a critical window in a woman's life and is a cardiovascular stress test. Um, I have no disclosures. However, uh, CIHR funding might count. So um, there might be a small error right there. We are also funded by CIHR to look at other health outcomes in women. So why does this uh, research matter? Our team takes a life course approach. We look at the whole aspects of a woman's life. Um, what's interesting in women is that pregnancy only occurs in, in, in them. Women do not have pregnancy-related exposures such as preeclampsia or placental abruption. Um, so pregnancy offers an opportunity to intervene very early in a woman's life to prevent cardiovascular disease. Cardiovascular risk factors are underappreciated in women. Um, most of the focus is on traditional risk factors such as smoking and diet that affect both sexes. And our team uh, believes that more research that encourages better use of pregnancy information will help uh, uh, prevent a greater number of cardiovascular events in women. Please move ahead, thank you. All right, so how have we done this? With our um, Heart and Stroke Foundation, we've uh, built a grant, we've built a cohort of um, 1.2 million women, soon to, to be around 1.3 million women, with 30 years of follow-up in Quebec. Um, we start the follow-up in the women at their first pregnancy and follow them over time um, for, for future hospitalizations for cardiovascular disease. We use hospital data to create this cohort. What's great in Canada is most women deliver in hospital and are admitted and therefore enter a hospital discharge abstract. Um, what's great in Quebec in particular is that the hospital dossier for women is based on her entire pregnancy experience. So her entire prenatal dossier enters the hospital data set. This allows us to look at very fine pregnancy characteristics, not only at the moment of delivery, but also earlier in her pregnancy to see how those relate to the future incidence of events such as uh, heart attack, strokes, and other cardiovascular outcomes. So some of the pregnancy characteristics that we've looked at during the past three years include, for example, preterm birth, obstetric hemorrhage, uh, which Vivian actually looked at, um, other placental disorders, um, congenital anomalies in offspring, how those relate to the maternal risk of cardiovascular disease in her future life, and also maternal mental health issues such as mood disorders, eating disorders, and substance misuse. So I'll straight away go into some examples of the findings that we've, we've made. Here's an example of study looking at women who had heart defects in their children. So I know the table is large. I'll ask you to focus only on the last column where it says non-critical, that refers to non-critical heart defects in the fetus. Um, <clears throat> in each row, those are different cardiovascular outcomes in women up to 30 years after her initial um, pregnancy. So if we just look at the top right number there, the 1.33, that is, is, refers to the comparison of women who had a fetus with a heart defect compared with a woman who did not have a heart defect in her fetus. So the first number, 1.33, means that women who had a heart defect in her fetus had a 33% greater risk of having a future cardiovascular hospitalization in her lifetime compared with um, women who did not have a heart defect in their fetus. So we can see here that um, there's a range of different cardiovascular problems and conditions that can occur in women who had these um, non-critical heart defects in their fetuses. So this was a very interesting study for us because it made the link between um, events happening in the fetus that were heart-related 
compared with uh, events later in the life of a woman. And we adjusted for, for a range of things such as maternal age, we include uh, maternal age, socioeconomic deprivation, um, previous comorbidities. We also accounted for or removed, eliminated women from the study who had themselves heart defects. Um, can you move to the next slide, please? Thank you. Here's another example of um, an interesting project for us, which was carried out by a student in our team who was actually a nutritionist. She was doing an epidemiology public health degree. Uh, she looked at um, bulimia nervosa. So uh, eating disorders are quite frequent in young, young women. And we wanted to see, we know that eating disorders can lead to cardiac, pregnant, uh, cardiac problems when the woman has an active eating disorder at that time, but the long-term risk was not known at, this at the time of this study. So this figure here uh, shows the women in our data who um, in the blue line, at the top dark blue line, is women with bulimia nervosa. The yellow line is women who did not have bulimia nervosa. These were other pregnant women in the cohort who had never been hospitalized or never declared having uh, bulimia nervosa. So we followed them over time and on the y-axis those are the number of cardiovascular hospitalizations per 100 women. So what you can see is that from very early on over time over the 12-year follow-up period, this follow-up was a bit shorter than this, we stopped at 12 years in this particular study, the number of hospitalizations increases dramatically throughout the study period for in terms of all kinds of cardiovascular outcomes. Um, I'll ask you to go to the next slide, please. In this table, we're looking at um, what's called um, similar to the risk ratio or the odds ratio, comparing again, women with bulimia and nervosa uh, with, uh, to those who do not have bulimia. And you can see just in the first line, top right number, the 4.225 means that women that have bulimia nervosa have four times greater risk of having a cardiovascular disease later in her life, up to 12 years later. So this um, study generated a lot of media interest as well. Uh, I'll ask you once more to scroll ahead. I see that I only have two minutes left if I'm right. Uh, so I'll go very quickly. Um, to talk about some of the knowledge translation opportunities from this grant that Heart and Stroke gave us. It allowed us to publish 10 articles, present at six conferences. We've given numerous media interviews, podcasts, uh, you name it. People have individuals write to us, individual patients write to us asking about, about our, our work. Um, the grant has been particularly helpful to advance other initiatives in Quebec, and in particular, the congenital anomaly surveillance system, where we are integrating an element of heart defect surveillance into that surveillance system, the maternal health surveillance system, where we are extending it to the long-term follow-up of women over time, including their cardiovascular outcomes. Uh, we've had uh, opportunities to share our work through Twitter that seems to generate a lot of buzz and as well through patient advocacy organizations. Um, um, an interesting example was the American Heart, oh, okay, sure, go ahead, we can skip that. <laughs> so some of our challenges have been uh, COVID, which I think that everyone has experienced this, so uh, I'll skip that as well. But we, we did capitalize it uh, on it to become entirely remote access data analysis that we do now. And that because of this, we are integrating students much more easily into our work. And that is what our focus is on right now, training the next generation of students by giving them remote access and helping them, guiding them in uh, work related to um, the life course approach in women. I think that I can end there. Thank you very much, Dr. Roger, for a lovely presentation. Thank you. I, will, I will now pass the mic to Dr. Field. Thanks so much, Dr. Ruka. It's my pleasure to be speaking to you all. We'll go next. 
So um, my research is focused on treatment strategies and outcomes after cerebral venous thrombosis, which, uh, as Dr. Ruka was saying, is a rare cause of stroke that primarily affects younger women. Um, this is our third year of support from Heart and Stroke. Uh, we've uh, been very well supported through a number of different uh, grants and salary awards, so I'm very grateful. Um, and uh, in addition to a trial, which is a uh, secret where we're looking at uh, different treatment strategies for the disease, we also have a parallel registry for people who are either uh, not meeting inclusion criteria or who don't want to be randomized. We also, uh, as I, I think a very satisfying part of our uh, research work, uh, have been working closely with patients. We have a patient engagement core that uh, provides guidance with respect to study materials, uh, things like consent forms, uh, the actual assessments, as well as knowledge translation strategies. Next slide. So again, Cerebral venous thrombosis preferentially affects younger women, and, and this is because it mainly affects uh, people who are uh, on oral contraceptives and uh, also affects women uh, in the uh, late uh, pregnancy and uh, early postpartum stage. One thing that's interesting about cerebral venous thrombosis is that unlike arterial types of stroke, um, functional outcomes tend to be better in that most survivors will be functionally independent. However, based on the way that we've previously conceptualized stroke outcomes, this hasn't really given us that much space to explore some of the other longer-term complications that survivors face. Um, we're finding increasingly that survivors have uh, ongoing issues related to subtle cognitive issues, uh, mood, uh, pain, particularly headache, uh, fatigue, and uh, overall reduced quality of life. So the secret trial is looking at uh, different treatment strategies. So uh, use of one of the newer uh, blood thinners, uh, factor 10A inhibitor called rivaroxaban, uh, versus normal standard of care, which is anticoagulation, uh, usually with low molecular weight heparin or uh, vitamin K antagonists like warfarin, um, and uh, comparing the safety of those profiles. Um, but uh, another thing that I think is very important that we're doing with the study, uh, both with the trial itself as well as the parallel registry, is getting some more valuable information about uh, some of these longer-term patient-centered uh, complications. And um, in turn, we might be able to use uh, these outcomes to power future phase three trials. One issue with cerebral venous thrombosis is that because it's a rare disease, it's hard to get a critical mass of patients to power treatment trials uh, uh, to produce higher quality evidence to uh, guide our treatment decisions. So if we figure out what the more common and important outcomes are to patients, we may have uh, be able to design higher quality studies. Next slide. So um, this is just one example of uh, the value that we've had in engaging with patients. Uh, in uh, January of 2019, we had a patient consultation forum. So we gathered with survivors of cerebral venous thrombosis from British Columbia and their loved ones. And uh, we had a graphic reporter that day and uh, we had an opportunity to discuss some outcomes that were important to patients and, and also how underappreciated some of these uh, uh, complications are in people that are functionally independent. You'll notice right in the middle of the um, uh, poster there, you have a picture where a physician is telling the patient that people with uh, cerebral venous thrombosis do really well, and the patient is telling the physician that, in fact, I'm actually not doing so well and I can't do the things that I used to. Next slide. So in terms of the trial, uh, we began recruitment in March of 2019, and uh, recruitment's going quite well. Uh, we're running the parallel registry alongside the trial, so as long as the trial is running, we're recruiting into the registry. Um, we are almost done our trial recruitment. We have uh, 44 patients out of 50 as of this week, and uh, another 40 have been uh, in the uh, registry so far, and about three quarters of participants are women. And uh, in, we are accounting for both uh, sex and self-reported gender of participants. Uh, reporting is separated by both, and uh, both sex and gender will be treated as co-variable in our analysis. Moving on. So um, lots of different uh, ways that we've been engaged with knowledge translation efforts. Um, with respect to survivors and their supporters, uh, as I mentioned, we have our patient engagement core who have been uh, advising us through the uh, planning and uh, execution stages and, and subsequently uh, end study knowledge translation stages of the trial. 
um, we had our patient form as discussed. And uh, one really wonderful thing about uh, engaging with patients is that we found out about other survivor groups that we can engage going forward. We actually had a discussion with uh, uh, one survivor who's uh, made us aware that there's a Facebook uh, group of over 1,300 survivors, uh, which we'll be able to engage with for future efforts for international uh, forums uh, that, that connect patients and researchers. Um, with respect to research, uh, we've had the opportunity to engage with the international uh, research community engaged in uh, CBT studies. Um, as I mentioned, it's a rare disease, so um, kind of everybody contributing as much data to advance our knowledge is very important. And um, I think that we've also provided some influence on the international research community by drawing more attention to some of these patient-centered outcomes uh, after cerebral venous thrombosis. Um, uh, lately, you may have heard of the uh, vaccine-associated cases of uh, cerebral venous thrombosis, a uh, very rare complication related to an autoimmune reaction with uh, particular COVID vaccines, and uh, we've also been contributing to the international monitoring effort uh, around this entity. With respect to healthcare providers, very excitingly, uh, we're engaged in the uh, planning stages for the first ever Canadian Best Practice Guidelines for Management of Cerebral Venous Thrombosis. And um, we'll also have the opportunity, because it's a rare disease and it uh, may not be diagnosed in its early stages, to provide better educational resources for uh, healthcare workers that may be frontline in uh, assessing these patients when they just present with early symptoms like headache. Um, again, with respect to the efforts around the vaccine-associated complications, uh, we've also had the opportunity to consult with groups like Thrombosis Canada, the Ontario Science Roundtable, and the Canadian Stroke Consortium with regards to appropriate uh, uh, clinical suspicion with regards to symptoms and workup for cerebral venous thrombosis. Next slide. So um, I think that, of course, COVID has been a challenge for everyone in so many aspects of their life and um, in turn it's also been quite disruptive to research activities. Um, fortunately one thing that we had built into the trial was a mechanism for um, engaging patients through telehealth even prior to COVID. Um, because cerebral venous thrombosis is a rare disease and patients may not necessarily present to teaching hospitals, we wanted a mechanism to engage as many patients as is possible from uh, as wide a uh, uh, catchment area as is possible. So um, we already had some telehealth assessment mechanisms built in. And of course, uh, once COVID started, these were very helpful for us to uh, continue engagement and follow up of our existing patients in addition to uh, bringing more patients into the study. Um, we've also provided some precedent for um, some things like the more complex cognitive assessments to be conducted remotely. And I, I think that's uh, something that's been very valuable to the literature in general, not necessarily just the CBT literature. Um, again, we're very excited about the potential for uh, engaging with the uh, online groups for, for cerebral venous thrombosis survivors. And uh, uh, our patient colleague was telling us that uh, because of COVID, so many more patients have had the opportunity to discover the group and uh, join the discussion. And uh, of course, uh, with uh, the vaccine associated cases of cerebral venous thrombosis, it's been an excellent opportunity, I think, to educate both the general public as well as healthcare workers about this rare disease. So some of the next steps that we're looking forward to, uh, of course, are, are the uh, main study results, and we'll be combining uh, that information about this newer type of blood thinner uh, with other studies conducted by international colleagues. We'll have the opportunity to uh, do some longer term follow up to find out some more information about some of the rarer longer term complications of cerebral venous thrombosis that can sometimes happen that we don't know that much about. Things like ongoing issues with um, intracranial hypertension, which can affect vision. Um, occasionally, you can get uh, rare formations of vascular malformations as a secondary complication. And as well, um, we don't know that much information about the natural history of recurrent uh, issues with venous clots in these patients. So that's something that we're really looking forward to finding out more about. And of course, I think there's a really excellent opportunity, especially given the online age that we've moved into, uh, to internationally connect both researchers and uh, cerebral venous thrombosis survivors. Next slide. So uh, that's it. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Field. Um, before I hand over to our next speaker, I'd just like to remind everyone to please put your questions in the question box and they will be answered after all the speakers have um, gone through their presentations. And now I'll hand over to Dr. Das Gupta.
Thank you, Vivian, and, and thanks to the two great speakers that have preceded me. So hopefully I'll be able to keep up the high quality. Um, I'm going to talk to you uh, today about uh, the project that we uh, were funded through uh, a Heart and Stroke and Health Canada, and that is looking at um, childhood, youth, and parental outcomes after gestational diabetes and gestational hypertension within and across families. Um, and so what we're doing in this study, as I'll explain, is we're looking at gestational diabetes and gestational hypertension across two pregnancies and relating this to disease in mothers, fathers, and offspring. And when I say fathers, I know you're surprised and I will tell you about that. Um, we are in year three of our study. We've requested a two-year no-cost extension because of some delays uh, related to data acquisition to begin with, uh, but also related to COVID. So by the way, by way of background, in the past, we have studied it through large retrospective cohort studies here in Quebec, um, relationships of gestational diabetes and gestational hypertension with diabetes, hypertension, and cardiovascular disease. Uh, and we've demonstrated that both are associated with higher CVD risk in mums and combined, they have an even greater effect as is the case for diabetes and for hypertension. But we've also interestingly shown that gestational diabetes and gestational hypertension are linked with um, uh, diabetes in partners and also a signal for cardiovascular disease, as I will show you. So in this study, what we want to look at is what happens to heart disease risk in parents if we consider GDM and GH status across two pregnancies and we will also look at associations with congenital heart disease and offspring. Next slide. So in this previous publication, um, we looked at 40,000 uh, women and their partners um, who had had gestational diabetes, and they were matched with 40,000 who did not. We used health administrative data from the province of Quebec, uh, as well as um, uh, the birth and death uh, registries. And we demonstrated that if women had either gestational diabetes or gestational hypertension, they had nearly a 15-fold increased risk for diabetes in about the decade that followed, a two-fold risk, increased risk of hypertension, and a 40% risk increase for cardiovascular disease. If they had both gestational diabetes and gestational hypertension, the risks were much higher with over 30-fold increase uh, for diabetes, uh, uh, almost six-fold risk increase for hypertension, and uh, doubling, more than a doubling of risk for cardiovascular disease. Interestingly though, in fathers as well, if the partner had either gestational diabetes or gestational hypertension, there was a 20% risk increase for diabetes that rose to 80% risk increase if the partner had had both conditions. And there were signals for increased risk for cardiovascular disease if the mum had either diabetes, uh, gestational diabetes or gestational hypertension. Next slide. So as we've heard and as we know, the, the, the um, occurrence of pregnancy-associated complications are recognized and, and, and proven to be risk factors for uh, cardiovascular disease in mothers. Um, so hypertensive disorders of pregnancy, gestational diabetes, uh, large for gestational age status of offspring, small for gestational age status, so a variety of risk factors. But what happens if we consider adverse pregnancy outcomes across more than one pregnancy in terms of CVD? Next slide. So our hypothesis is that the lowest risk group will be the, the, if we talk about the mothers to begin with, the moms who've had neither gestational diabetes nor gestational hypertension in either pregnancy, and that makes a lot of sense. But we hypothesize that there is kind of a graded risk increase. So if you have um, gestational diabetes or gestational hypertension in the first pregnancy, but not in the second, we hypothesize that that may be, indicate that you're on now a better trajectory and that your risk may not be as high as, for example, someone who ha had neither GDM nor gestational hypertension in the first pregnancy, but went on to develop it in the second. Similarly, women who had these conditions in both pregnancies, uh, one or both, uh, would be at higher risk. And of course, the highest would be those who not only had gestational diabetes or gestational hypertension in the first, but went on to develop actually diabetes or hypertension uh, in the second. Um, next slide. 
So our data source, like Dr. Auger's, is uh, the, the health administrative data from the province of Quebec, and that includes um, the diagnostic codes um, uh, for hospitalizations, but also for outpatient visits, allowing us to apply a variety of health administrative database um, validated definitions for diabetes, hypertension, and cardiovascular disease. Um, and these, we also have access to variables um, on deprivation, material deprivation, and it's a postal code based index that incorporates other aspects of social and material deprivation from census data. Um, and we finally have linkage to birth and stillbirth registries, which provide rich information uh, such as birth weight, fetal sex, uh, gestational age, uh, maternal years of education, and parental country of birth, which, with, which allows us to really properly apply definitions for gestational diabetes and gestational hypertension, which are diagnosed um, at 20 weeks of gestation or later, because prior to that, they, they actually may represent pre-existing diabetes or hypertension. Next slide. So just to give you an overview of how we're conducting this study. So in the, we have a, a, a large study cohort of a, a nearly half a million mothers, half a million fathers, and a million offspring, because we have both the first and second pregnancy. So for the mothers and fathers, the index date is 12 weeks after the second delivery, and we will follow forward, and we have up to 30 years of follow-up um, of these parents looking for cardiovascular disease. Defining the exposures, so we look back over the two pregnancies. Prior to 20 weeks gestation in the first pregnancy, we exclude um, those families where the mom uh, had diabetes or hypertension uh, before pregnancy based on uh, diagnostic codes, before 20 weeks gestational age, I should say. And then we look at the experiences in pregnancy to define gestational diabetes, gestational hypertension, uh, and diabetes development or hypertension development between pregnancies. So we look at the, a variety, the variety of combinations of patterns. Next slide. So it, between 2018 and 2019, we had a, a long process of gaining access. Uh, we have a large bo a body called the Commission L'Accès à l'Information in Quebec. Uh, we had our ethics boards, the Quebec Statistical Institute, and there was also a change in some of the processes and procedures during that time uh, with the Quebec Statistical Institute taking uh, control of all of the, uh, of the data sets. Uh, and ultimately requiring the data uh, analysis occur at designated centers rather than the data being pulled out into our um, research institute. Uh, so that process of approval took us to the end of 2019 and then there was a period of preparing the data for our use uh, in 2020 which was delayed uh, because of COVID. Uh, since October 2020, we have been working at the data center, cleaning the data, delineating the cohort, defining variables, and we're in the thick of the analyses now, which we hope to continue over the next uh, two years. Next slide. Because of some complex vetting procedures that doesn't allow us to, to give specific numbers at a, a preliminary analysis stage, I won't give you specific numbers, but as I mentioned, cohort inception, so we constructed the cohort among women who delivered at least two babies between 1990 and 2012 with follow-up 2019. So the follow-up is 70 to 29 years. And we, have over, we had over 480,000 mothers to start with, Following exclusions, that's come down to approximately 440,000. Uh, so we exclude if we have missing age on gestational age, if there's prior diabetes or hypertension before the first delivery, uh, if there's more than one father for two offspring, which does occur in a certain proportion, um, or if there was death or a CVD event before the second delivery. And so overall, we see that about 10% of mums have had gestational diabetes in one of the different categories in one or both pregnancies, uh, and have had gestational hypertension or hypertension in one, uh, in one or both pregnancies. And within each of the subcategories that we, we talked about, there's about 2 or 3% of that 10%. So we have a good uh, distribution of our exposure categories with good numbers. Over the follow-up period, there are more than 10,000 CBD events in the mums and over 20,000 in the fathers, so we have uh, good power to look at our, our questions of interest. And the so far, very preliminary look, the patterns that we're seeing are consistent with our hypotheses in terms of outcomes, certainly in the mothers. So we're really excited to, to continue these analyses.
So our next step, steps are to conduct our survival analyses and construct our models, interpret the findings, write manuscripts and present our work. As in the past, uh, we really engage on in a, a large no, uh, knowledge translation um, endeavor uh, with press releases, uh, impact on position statements and guidelines, and really a goal to um, help uh, uh, healthcare providers, policymakers and researchers like ourselves use uh, shared family risk as a lever to encourage family-based uh, CBD pre prevention. Um, we, we may look to uh, creating a risk engine, perhaps working with some of uh, the presenters today, um, and, uh, and we're really excited with this, uh, with this uh, initiative. Next slide. I'd just uh, I'd like to acknowledge my team, uh, including my doctoral student, P uh, Joseph Moussa, who some of his doctoral studies have been funded by the Société Québécoise d'Hypertension Intérielle, as well as through uh, awards from McGill University, uh, Moura Daou, my programmer and analyst, and my colleagues, uh, Elham Rami and Parmita Chowdhury, very experienced statisticians, Miranda Nakla, a pediatric endocrinologist, and Maria Di Tascar, a pediatric cardiologist. So thank you very much to the Heart and Stroke Foundation and Health Canada for your support and uh, look forward to interesting results. Thank you very much, Dr. Dasgupta, for an interesting presentation. And now I'll hand over to our final speaker, Dr. Jiwa. Okay, so um, hello everybody, good afternoon. So thanks to the Heart and Stroke Foundation of Canada for giving me this, this uh, very uh, great opportunity. So I would like to say that uh, since I have my own lab in 2008, I have a project funded by the Heart and Stroke Foundation of Canada. And this project is entitled Neurovascular Coupling in Hypertension. The project had been renewed and had converged toward arterial stiffness. So now we are in the third year of the project and because of COVID, we lost uh, time this year and I will ask for an extension uh, without any cost uh, for the next year. So to present our project, I will begin with the bad news. So in anyone, even healthy, our arteries become rigid as we age especially from the age of 50. The stiffness can be accentuated by certain lifestyles or pathologies such as smoking and diabetes. But is it important to keep our uh, arteries flexible? We think that it's very important because the flexibility of these arteries is responsible for absorbing the pulsatile energy of the blood at the exit of the heart. So as it's shown here in the graph on the right, uh, it's a graph showing the pressure according to the size of the vessels. It shows that as we get into smaller blood vessels, the, the pulsatility decreases and the blood flow becomes uh, continuous. But when the arteries are rigid, the small vessels continue to receive a very pulsatile blood flow and their structure is not made to resist this type of stress. So therefore it could impact these arteries and of course the surrounding tissues. Next slide, please. So the question is, could this be harmful to the brain? Uh, to answer this question, our team developed a new murine model of arterial stiffness because in the existing models, the way to generate the stiffness could directly impact the brain. I will give you one example. For example, the model with nicotine and vitamin D3. These two molecules could induce arterial stiffness, but could also go to the brain and impact the, neur the neurons uh, themselves. So in our model, we apply calcium chloride directly to the carotid artery, and then calcium salts form in the wall of the carotid artery. And subsequently, the, there's an increase of collagen and the elastin fibers are broken. So in this model, there's no increase in systemic arterial pressure and no decrease in the carotid artery lumen size. 
So these are very important points because we didn't want to generate a model of hypertension or a model of hypoperfusion. So this model is very specific to study the effect of arterial stiffness on the brain. So the aim of our project is to investigate the mechanisms by which arterial stiffness contributes to brain defects in males and females in order to identify potential therapeutic targets. So first, we demonstrated that arterial stiffness at the carotid artery level impairs cerebral blood flow regulation and cognitive functions. Next slide, please. So why is it important to uh, study uh, sex difference in this problematic? Firstly, women present greater arterial stiffness. Secondly, the association between increased arterial stiffness and mortality is almost twice in women than men. Consequently, we hypothesize that the female brain may be more vulnerable to arterial stiffness, especially after menopause. In another of our projects, we studied the impact of arterial stiffness on brain health in humans, and we tried to determine the threshold of stiffness that could impact the brain. So another question that we ask, is this threshold the same in men and women? Also, um, we wonder whether it explains the highest risk for Alzheimer's disease in women. So we show you now uh, some of our data. Um, so uh, yeah, thanks for changing the slides. So in this uh, this this uh, this figure, sorry, the the main endpoint of our study is neurovascular coupling. Neurovascular coupling is the mechanisms by which blood flow increases uh, uh, in function of neuronal activity. So in mice to study neurovascular coupling we stimulate the whiskers so that the cerebral blood flow increases in the somatosensory cortex. And then we measure the cerebral blood flow with a laser Doppler probe. So here, if you look at the graphs, let, let's focus on the, the uh, higher, uh, upper panel, sorry, the left graph. So if you look at the first two columns represents the males and the last two columns represents the females, and the um, black columns represents the controls, which receive NaCl in, uh, instead of calcium chloride. And the white columns are the mice, which receives the calcium chloride and which have um, uh, stiff carotid artery. So as you can see here, the males uh, have impairs of raw blood flow increase in response to whisker stimulation. Then we wanted to uh, verify the endothelial function. So we superfused the brain with acetylcholine. And again, in males, the response to acetylcholine is impaired. But in both cases, the females are protected. So next slide, please. So we wanted to know whether at the menopause, then female would lose this protection. So what we did is that we um, in, did a variectomy to these females. And in another group of females, we treated uh, these uh, mice with estradiol. So if you look at the figures, again, uh, the, the black columns represents the controls and the white columns are the mice with the stiff carotid arteries. And again, in response to whisker stimulation, the female mice, a the mice, the cerebral blood flow is impaired, and this impairment disappears with estradiol treatment. Again, in response to acetylcholine, the avaricomized mice uh, response is impaired and recovered with estradiol a treatment. So it seems that estradiol protects from arterial stiffness. Next slide, please. So um, we published four papers and we are now working on two more uh, papers trying to investigate the effect of menopause induced by 4 vinyl cyclohexane d epoxide that we call VCD because VCD destroys pre-entral follicles 
causing uh, early ovarian failure, and it's a very well characterized model for the gradual onset of menopause. So it mimics very well what happens in females, in women, I mean, and it's a very good model to, uh, to discover new treatments for uh, menopausal women. Uh, so in our last paper, we will test different treatments to protect males and females' brain from arterial stiffness. Next slide, please. So uh, we were invited to give three presentations in the scientific meetings and three presentations in different universities for this project. Next slide, please. Um, so we uh, this project generated very important interesting opportunities. So first, I was invited uh, by the Canadian Vassar Network Summer School to give a course about sex differences in, uh, in the uh, vulnerability of brain to arterial stiffness. Uh, I was invited to give talks to scientific audience and large uh, public. I'm also a co-applicant to create the vascular training health research training platform. This is a, a platform which is multidisciplinary and it's uh, all over Canada and it's to give an opportunity for the, the, the students, PhD students and master degree students and postdocs to learn more about this problematic. And I was asked to be part of it, especially for my expertise on arterial stiffness and um, uh, sex differences. So the objectives of, in my case, for the um, knowledge translation is to inform, generate awareness and interest for therapy development, because I, I want people to be more aware of the importance of this parameter, which is arterial stiffness and the impact that it could have on the brain. Next slide, please. So um, this generated many collaborations because our uh, neurin model is very popular. So it generated local, national and international collaborations. Next slide, please. Whoops, sorry. Uh, previous slide, please. <laughs> Too fast. Okay, uh, so the popularity of the model is was really the opportunity uh, in this, um, in this uh, project. Uh, as I mentioned, there was a challenge associated to COVID because I were, the student who was supposed to work on this project for the last year is from uh, Iran and you, you arrive more than one year later. Um, again, with, because of the popularity of this uh, project, it gives new collaborations and of course, uh, new collaborations and new projects and of course, of course this problem my career. And the, this summer or this fall, I plan to apply again to the Heart and Stroke Foundation, but for a project about arterial stiffness and Alzheimer's disease in males and females. Why Alzheimer's disease? It's because we uh, made a very interesting observation in our model. Uh, the observation is that we observe specifically neuronal death in the hippocampus. So we are now wondering whether arterial stiffness can induce, precipitate, or accelerate Alzheimer's disease. So next slide, please. So to finish, I would like to present uh, the students and my research assistant who worked on this uh, project. So Natalia Sadikova, it was her master degree project. Gervais Muir, it was his PhD project. Florencia Yulita was part of it also during her postdoctoral studies and uh, Ali Dadras arrived uh, recently to continue to work on that and Dian Valaram, our research assistant, uh, worked on that uh, all, uh, during the whole period. So thanks a lot for your attention and thanks a lot also to the Art and Stroke Foundation of Canada for their support. Thank you very much um, for that presentation. So um, it's time for questions and it looks like we have time for only one question. So I would just kick it off. Um, this is 
I'm open to all the speakers. Um, so ever since you were awarded this funding, have you observed any change in interest and level of support in your institutions and with your colleagues to address sex and gender over time? So has there been any change since you were first awarded this um, funding regarding sex and gender in research? I think there's a lot of there's a lot of interest it was building and I think um, having this particular funding and having these projects funded um, elevated the importance of it because for uh, you know the Heart and Stroke Foundation and Health Canada to almost uh, acknowledge or endorse the importance of sex and gender issues brings it more into kind of the framework of yeah this is you know this is something important to study um, I think for our, you know, for many people, uh, while um, health issues in 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 women uh, and in marginalized populations have been studied for many years, sometimes it's viewed as a side topic. And I think more and more it's understood as nope, there are different issues, social, biological, uh, and I, I think it's notable that we all happen to be um, female researchers. So you know that's that's also kind of a nice um, aspect to it. So that would would be my comment. Thanks, Dr. Field. Do you want to add anything? Sure. I, I was just saying, I, I think there's been a huge cultural shift in the last five years, just in terms of what's expected uh, of scientists in general. I think now with uh, grant applications, the requirement that you have to undergo uh, training to understand the difference between sex and gender and how to incorporate in your research, the fact that you have to you know, consciously account for any application, how you're going to account for differences in sex and gender is so important. And, and I think, you know, again, it's not just the um, attention within science, it's also attention with respect to um, disparities in who uh, are becoming scientists. Uh, I think that that have helped us uh, kind of draw attention to representation in, in research for that reason as well. Thank you. Dr. Roger? Yes, thank you, Cher. Um, I'm in Quebec and I'm closely linked with the health ministry. Um, although the term sex and gender is not specifically used, uh, by the ministry, there is a greater push to address women and develop uh, systems of surveillance and intervention targeting those group, that group specifically. So that's what I've noticed has changed over the years that um, the government is contacting our team more and more over time to uh, address different issues that are frequently specific to, to women. Um, like assisted reproduction and the, the whole pregnancy issue as well, um, that this is progressing and there seems to be more of a push towards it that's happening right now. I don't know why specifically, whether it's related to uh, the growing consciousness in Canada as well, uh, but I've noticed that it's really beginning to move forward now. That's good. Dr. Jiwa? Yes, um, so I work on hypertension since I'm a PhD student, so since a, a while, and it was assumed that we were working on male uh, animals, and, and slowly, slowly, I try to influence my colleagues and also to explain my students why it's very, why historically it began with males and why now it's very important to, to study females and also how we should do it. And also the, the model that we use, the VCD model, uh, it, it's a model that generated a lot of interest around me. Interesting. So before I hand over back to uh, uh, Christine, do you have any final comments regarding the funding, your research, COVID-19 or anything? Yeah. You can go first, Dr. Roger. Well, <clears throat> I feel I could speak for everyone that um, we're all very appreciative of the contributions of Heart and Stroke that have really helped us progress in all like our, our separate angles towards heart disease. Um, that help was invaluable. And I hope that the government will see the value of it and continue to support us in our, our activities in the future to maintain this wave that, that we're on right now. Yeah, I agree. Does anyone else want to 
comment? Yeah, in my case, it was extremely important because it get, really gave me the opportunities to switch from the study studies which were only in males because historically it is what was done and now to give me the opportunity to also study uh, females and and also to encourage me to do that i think it was uh, invaluable really yeah i totally okay. agree I, it there's no question that it uh, you know the previous work i i, I have done has been that's related, garnered a lot of interest, but I think really focusing on heart disease, which is the ultimate outcome of a lot of the risk factors we look at, is going to be even more powerful and hopefully change, help people realize how important it is to change behaviors. Mm -hmm. Just just to comment on your question about commenting about COVID, I, I think one thing that I hope will come out of this that's helpful for uh, women is the ability to engage uh, better through the remote options that have become increasingly acceptable, uh, both in terms of uh, you know conference attendance if you're looking after small children or elderly family members, uh, as well as uh, participation in research and engagement in things like telerehab and, and clinical care. So I, I hope that that's one positive thing that can come out of this. I hope so too. Thank you, everyone. And I'll pass the mic back to Kristen. Thank you, Dr. Uka, and thank you to our panelists. Um, Dr. Field, I couldn't have asked for a better segue, uh, speaking of virtual care. So just to remind everyone, um, on May 4th, that Heart and Stroke is co-hosting a webinar with Heart Life about enhancing virtual heart failure care. Um, and of course, before that next week, we have one last session as part of this series, um, building on the progress that you have all made related to sex and gender and taking that more nuanced approach to intersectional considerations and research. So please join us. Um, last slide. Thank you everyone for your participation today. I know it's a busy time. It's a hard time. So please be well, uh, be healthy, and we'll be in touch. Thank you. Merci. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.